Well, on Tuesday evening, we had a great time at Pancakes Prayer and Praise, and we heard about, as well as eating pancakes, we heard about church planting and church revitalization in Nottingham. And Rue, as he was leading, he began the, the, the evening by reminding us of a sermon that a guy called Jonathan Lamb preached here at Cornerstone from 1 Samuel a few years ago. And in that sermon from the passage, uh, Jonathan Lamb spoke about Ebenezer's a word that was used in that passage. Ebenezer's are, are stones that, that caused God's people to look back with memory, to look back with thankfulness about how he'd led them in their journey so far. But these, this Ebenezer stone also ca- caused them and caused us to look onwards and upwards into the, our future journey with, with the Lord. Well, Jonathan Lamb also wrote a book about leadership, it's called Integrity. And in that book, he shares the results of a survey that was done. And in this survey, people were asked about the qualities that they expect in a church leader. And so all of the results were put together to to, to form what people expect, what people think might be the qualities of a perfect church leader. So here are the results. The perfect church leader preaches for exactly 12 minutes. Well, I did on Christmas Day. The perfect church leader is 28 years of age, but has been preaching for 30 years. They wear good clothes, buy good books, drive a good car, give generously, generously to the poor, and has a low salary. They work from 8 a.m. until midnight every day and is the church caretaker. They frequently condemn sin, but never upset anybody. They make 15 daily calls to parish families, visit the housebound and hospitalized, and they're always in the office when needed. And finally, the perfect church leader is good looking. Well, I'm sorry to be such a disappointment to you all. Well, hopefully we get a better picture than that from 2 Timothy, and in particular, 2 Timothy chapter 2. So please turn back there. It's page 1196 in the church Bibles. And we're going to spend our time looking at those verses that were read earlier. If you were here last week, we saw how Timothy was to be strong in the grace that's in Christ Jesus and how he was to entrust the authentic message of the gospel to reliable people who in turn would be able to pass it on to others. And we saw how he was to follow the examples of Paul and ultimately of Jesus Christ. And the rest of chapter 2 continues this vivid portrayal for Timothy of what his role was to be in teaching and transmitting the true good news of Jesus. And so from this chapter, we can see the implications for leaders in the church today. There's a particular application for those with roles like mine, those of us who have the role of the public teaching of God's word. Actually, there's also uh, implications for all of us, for anyone who holds leadership responsibility in the churches. And in fact, as we'll see, there's applications for all of us, whether we are a leader or, a not, or, or not. Now, you might think that the perfect church leader never repeated an illustration or a sermon point, and I certainly fall down on that one as well. But actually, the beginning of our verses today urge Timothy to keep reminding God's people of the same thing the authentic truths of the gospel. So verse 14 onwards, look at that with me. Keep reminding God's people of these things. Warn them before God against quarreling about words. It is of no value and only ruins those who listen. Do your best to present yourself to God as one approved, a worker who does not need to be ashamed and who correctly handles the word of truth. Avoid godless chatter, because those who indulge in it will become more and more ungodly. 
Their teaching will spread like gangrene. Among them are Hymenaeus and Philetus, who have departed from the truth. They say that the resurrection has already taken place, and they destroy the faith of some. If you're looking for a tradesperson to do some kind of job for you, you might look up a, uh, a website such as Trusted Traders. Organizations such as these assess and endorse tradespeople. So you know their reputation. You know that their work is going to be good and authentic. Well, the Bible outlines its own kind of approach for church leaders and teachers that we can trust. And in these verses, we're presented with two contrasting types of leaders and teachers. One type is a trusted teacher. Approved, tried, tested. And the other is the opposite. So let's compare and contrast from these verses, these two types of leaders and teachers. Verse 15, you'll see that Timothy is encouraged to do your best to present yourself to God as one approved. A worker who does not need to be ashamed and who correctly handles the word of truth. We see there that the that the key difference between two, the two types of leaders is how they handle the word of truth, the authentic gospel message. And this verse has the, the sense of cutting a straight path in a straight direction. Roman roads, you might know the saying that Roman roads are famously, famously straight, straight highways. And the Apostle Paul had traveled on a lot of Roman roads. And cutting a good path enables others to follow and keep in the safe way. So for Timothy, that meant keeping to the authentic gospel that he had heard from Paul. For us, now that we have that message written down, it means keeping to the authoritative message of the Scriptures. So Timothy needed to warn people away from the kind of conversations and quarrels that are valueless, and that lead to error. And he was in to invest time and effort and energy in instructing believers who are pure-hearted but had been misguided, badly taught, misled, even deceived. And one of the ways that he does that is by keeping reminding God's people of these things. To regularly teach that following Jesus means following Jesus, following Jesus on the path that he took of suffering and then glory, of the cross and then the crown. Timothy is not to major on the minors. He's to keep the main thing the main thing. And he devotes him, he's to devote himself to what really matters in the kingdom. Trusted teachers aren't to use the pulpit to show off or to, to make God's word say what they might want it to say. Trusted teachers are to correctly handle the word of truth. Correctly handle God's word. Contrast the careful words of Timothy with the careless words of the false teachers. False teachers are like, like an archer that deviates from the target. Rather than handling the word of truth correctly, they do, do the opposite. They quarrel about words. They indulge in disputes that move people away from remembering the real Jesus and the authentic gospel. And the atmosphere of such conversations is, is never a humble spirit of submission to the word of God. The atmosphere of such conversations might be, might be an atmosphere of intellectual competitiveness. Or it might be an atmosphere of a desire to be relevant in a particular culture. But just look at some of the hallmarks in these verses of false teaching. Quarreling. Of no value. 
godless chatter. Literally, less of God. Moving away from him, less of God. Departing from the truth. Indulgent. And Paul gives some examples from the first century that Timothy would, be, would have been well aware of. Hymenaeus and Philetus. We don't know lots about them, but we do, we're told that these teachers said that the resurrection had already taken place. Now that might confuse us a little bit, but the reference to the resurrection there doesn't mean Jesus' resurrection. Of course, that had already taken place. Rather, they were referring to the resurrection of all God's people at the end of time, which, of course, hasn't, hadn't happened and still hasn't happened. And these false teachers were claiming to have already experienced this, such that they were saying that now we're free from the troubles and the trials of this life. And they held out this false promise of that experience to their listeners in the here and now. Let me share with you what Carolyn Lacey says about this. The false teachers in Ephesus were doing this. She's talking about adding to the gospel message. Hymenaeus and Philetus are teaching that all God's future promises have already been fulfilled. And all the blessings of heaven can be experienced now. For them, this means freedom from suffering and a license to either withdraw from the world completely or become complacent about sin. In contrast, Timothy must be diligent to teach God's word accurately. Unlike the false teachers who look to people for approval, he must seek approval from God alone. Are we beginning to grasp the alternatives that are set before every Christian teacher? Are we beginning to grasp the alternatives that are set before every person who has leadership in a church? To cut a safe, straight path or to dig a dangerous route? To be approved by God or to always be popular with people? And these two alternatives are presented to every Christian leader and teacher. But it's not just an alternative that's presented to those like me. It's an alternative that is presented to, to all of us because we are also listeners. Leaders and teachers have an impact not just on themselves, but on their hearers and followers. So let me set the alternatives before us all as listeners. So just look at the words and the phrases that are associated with the impact these false teachers have. I've put them in a different color on the screen. Look at the words that describe the impact. Verse 14, ruins those who listen. Verse 16, godless. Verse 17, spreads like gangrene. Verse 18, departed from the truth and destroys the faith of some. Taken together, that's not a healthy or attractive picture, is it? Like gangrene spreading infection quickly in the community. False teaching doesn't destroy bodies or limbs or muscles, but it destroys faith. False teaching raises expectations and then fails to deliver. False teaching is dishonoring to God and damaging to people. As John Stott said, we would be wise to ask ourselves regarding every kind of teaching, both what is its attitude towards God and what effect it has upon people.
There's quite a lot of talk uh, now about churches wanting to be, needing to be progressive. So you'll hear things like, we need to be a progressive church. We need to be a progressive church to win the next generation. Well, let me say this. Every church is a progressive church. Every leader is a progressive leader. The only question is in which direction we are progressing. The only question is in which direction we're progressing. False teaching progresses as in verse 16, becoming more and more ungodly. True teaching progresses in Christ-likeness. As in verse 19, the second half, turning away from wickedness. To be biblically progressive is to, prog to progress, to become more like Christ. And I want Cornerstone to be that kind of progressive church. Becoming more Christ-like. Growing in love and holiness. And actually being that kind of church is the church, the kind of churches that God uses to reach the generations that follow. Jonathan Griffiths. The gospel must, of course, be presented and communicated in constantly fresh and innovative ways. But the message itself tolerates no modification. When it comes to the substance of the message, gospel ministers are fundamentally stewards and not innovators. Those who take liberties with the message will advance in only one direction, that of ungodliness and spiritual ruin. Or contrast that with the fruit of true teaching which always honors God and edifies his people. True teaching which keeps people on the safe, ancient paths. Which doesn't lead people down blind alleys or dead ends or dangerous highways. And these verses urge us to avoid false teaching. Do you see that word there? Avoid. And if I can be blunter than I might normally be. Stop listening to podcasts and YouTube preachers that tell you that you can have health and wealth and prosperity in the here and now. That is a false gospel. Avoid false teaching. Stop listening to false teaching of any kind that ruins those who listen. Avoid godless chatter that, that leads to a downward spiral. Avoid teaching that has departed from the truth and which destroys the faith of some. It can be a common experience to be shaken when we see false teaching prevailing as we do it at, at different times in different ways in different societies. And that can shake us. At the very least, it can be unsettling. But verse 19 reminds us that our foundation in God remains as steady as ever, however unsettled we might feel. Verse 19. Nevertheless, God's foundation stands firm, sealed with this inscription. The Lord knows who are his. And everyone who confesses the name of the Lord must turn away from wickedness. The Lord's sovereign and eternal purposes are depicted as an unmovable stone of a great building. And ultimately, the Lord knows who are his, who are his true people, his appointed leaders. It's God's church. And he knows who are his. 
Just because a church or a denomination has the word church in its title doesn't mean it truly is a church. And you'll know that I've been asking us to reflect on what Cornerstone is going to be like in 2053 throughout this series. Well, in 2053, Cornerstone Church will only be a church if we've held to the truth over the coming decades. I'm sure that in 2053, the building will still say on the side, Cornerstone Church. It will still say they have the label. But that won't mean anything unless we have held on to the truth by passing it on to the next generation. One man has built a scale model of one of Elizabethan England's most significant stately homes. He's built it entirely out of Lego. You might recognize that as, as Hardwick Hall, uh, just up the motorway. My, my grandparents used to li live in Derbyshire, and there's the small holding that they had. Uh, on a clear day, it would, you could, uh, they were on top of a big hill, and you could overlook it. You could, you, you could see Hardwick Hall from there. My granddad would always say without fail, Hardwick Hall, by, he'd say, Hardwick Hall, more glass than wall. Every time. And every time I drive past it on the motorway, I will say exactly the same now. So uh, if you're ever in the car with me going north in the M1, look out for me saying that. Well, Dave Shaw from 53 from Mansfield has, has, has built this, and he's displayed his work on a Lego Ideas website, whereas if it gets enough votes, it, there's a chance it will be considered for, for production. He built it out of a, a, a Lego Coliseum thing, but he had to, had to order some extra uh, window bricks for the glass because there's more glass than wall. Well, in verses 20 and 21, Paul is using an illustration to underpin his teaching. He paints a picture. And grand houses in the ancient world or in Elizabeth, Elizabeth in England or any, anywhere else would have both expensive utensils and uh, everyday ones. Those used on special occasions or in personal service of the owners and those that were used in basic use in the kitchen or the scullery. So in verse 20, in a large house, there are articles not only of gold and silver, but also of wood and clay. Some are for special purposes and some for common use. Those who cleanse themselves from the latter will be instruments for special purposes, made holy, useful to the master, and prepared to do any good work. The illustration is that in God's great household, these articles or instruments are representative of those true and false teachers amongst God's people. It's not referring to the members of the church, but rather the, the teachers and those who are true teachers are the ones who are useful to the master. And continuing in verse 22 and 23. Flee the evil desires of youth and pursue righteousness, faith, love and peace. Along with those who call on the Lord out of a pure heart. Don't have anything to do with foolish and stupid arguments because you know they produce quarrels. Well, in these verses, Timothy is urged to both flee from some things and run towards others. So do you see both of those words there in verse 22? Flee and pursue. Flee the evil desires of youth. And in the context, it's referring to an argumentative spirit. And I can, test from, can testify from my own experience and my foolishness, certainly in my 20s, and those of you who knew me in my early 20s will be able to testify to that as well, of an unhealthy desire to seek out unhelpful theological controversies, to want to win the argument at any cost, to be right and to be seen to be right to make minor points into major points and to belittle or to look down on those that didn't think exactly the same as me about every small detail. 
And Timothy is to flee such desires, not by standing still, but by pursuing another goal. Pursue righteousness, faith, love, and peace, along with those who call on the Lord out of a pure heart. Isn't that a delightful appeal? Pursue righteousness, faith, love, and peace, along with those who call on the Lord out of a pure heart. The path we're to walk isn't a lonely path. The race we're to run is not a solo pursuit. We're in a team. We're pursuing righteousness, faith, love, and peace together. We're in good company. And it's not just me and it's not just the leaders here in this church. It's all of us who call on the Lord out of a pure heart. So together we flee spiritual danger and we run towards spiritual good. We're to come alongside one another to pursue righteousness, faith, love, and peace together. That's how we're to keep the unity of the Spirit. Just one example in the coming year or two as we, as we ref, uh, spend time in reflection and renewal about biblically healthy discipleship, and membership, and leadership at Cornerstone. This is what we're pursuing together. And then the following verses speak about the characteristics of the Lord's servant. We've seen this throughout the chapter, and it's encapsulated really in verses 24 to 26, verse 24. And the Lord's servant must not be quarrelsome, but must be kind to everyone. Able to teach, not resentful. Opponents must be gently instructed in the hope that God will grant them repentance, leading them to a knowledge of the truth. And that they will come to their senses and escape from the trap of the devil who has taken them captive to do his will. It's not that all controversy is prohibited. There is a calling not only to teach truth, but to correct error. And whilst leaders mustn't shrink from this, we mustn't be quarrelsome either. Some of you will be aware that over the last few years, various leadership scandals and abuses have been brought to light in the UK and around the world. And we lament the damage and the hurt that has been caused. And I'd reflect that UK evangelicalism has been, has been good at raising up leaders who have been able to teach. But these verses tell us that much more is needed in church leaders than just the ability to teach. Look at those verses again. We leaders must be kind to everyone. We must not be resentful. We must gently instruct. And we must trust that God will do his work in bringing those who have departed from the truth to repentance. And may God grant us the grace to raise up leaders, not just who are able to teach, but who are these things as well. Leaders who don't have outbursts of reactions. Leaders who don't mock people or belittle them but leaders who lead and teach with patient love and gentle correction. Some of the words in these verses do give us a sense of the seriousness of these matters. Those in error do need to repent and gently be led to the truth, to come to their senses, to escape the devil's trap. I think that's referring to real believers who've been misled or deceived by false teaching. We can't always just agree to disagree. And these verses don't have in mind the unconverted teachers who are dealt with in a very different way, as we'll see in chapter 3. And it requires wisdom and discernment to distinguish between all of these different scenarios in church life. And our godliness in our relationships in the midst of it is a great challenge and an opportunity. We began by hearing the results of a survey of what would make up the perfect 
Christian leader if we put everybody's wants all together? Well, throughout this chapter, we've seen a composite portrayal of an actual ideal Christian leader painted through a variety of words and images. And that can feel a heavy responsibility on those of us who are leaders. There can be a weight of expectation. And of course, the knowledge that that I am not a perfect leader. There are times when I fail. There are times when I am foolish. And that's one of the reasons that the chapter begins, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. And there is only one perfect leader of God's, pe- of God's people. There is one who is perfectly the Lord's servant. Prophesied centuries before in Isaiah 42. Here is my servant whom I uphold. My chosen one in whom I delight. I will put my spirit on him and he will bring justice to the nations. He will not shout or cry out or raise his voice in the streets. A bruised reed he will not break. And a smoldering wick he will not snuff out. In faithfulness he will bring forth justice. He will not falter or be discouraged till he establishes justice on earth. In his teaching, the islands will put their hope. May we put our hope in Jesus Christ. Listen to him as he leads us into the future. Jesus Christ is our cornerstone. And on him alone we build. Let's bow our heads as we pray. Lord Jesus, we praise you that you are the chief shepherd. That you are the one who does not break bruise reeds. Who does not snuff out smoldering wicks. The one who establishes justice. Lord, we thank you for the under shepherds who have passed on the truth to us to hold. Lord, help us not to be misled or deceived by false teachers. And Lord, cause us to progress in holiness and Christ-likeness. Pursuing righteousness, faith, love, peace. And Lord, enable us to to fulfill our responsibilities. Because you are sovereign. Lord Jesus, we put our hope in you. Amen.